Disaster recovery is becoming a more common task for communities and authorities as the scale and frequency of disasters increase. While knowledge on effective recovery has changed significantly in the past two decades and continues to develop through research and practice, recovery is an area that has traditionally been poorly understood and applied by response agencies. The cyclical nature of disasters and the fact that the complex impacts of disasters are extremely hard to predict and prepare for means that emergency response personnel often don't have knowledge or experience of best practice approaches. Rowena Frost is the Municipal Recovery Manager for the Surf Coast Shire Council in Victoria. Her role is to lead relief and recovery in the event of a disaster and to work with Council and its partners to ensure that plans are in place to support the local community under various disaster scenarios. Well, some of the key challenges that um, I face, we face as a, a Council in Surf Coast Shire, the diverse nature of the community that, that we have. So we have our residents, we have our non-residents, we have our visitors um, in large numbers to the Shire. So a lot of our recovery with a major incident at Surf Coast Shire, yes, there's the social and natural and built elements of it, but economic is really important as well. Rowena is meeting with Professor Lisa Gibbs from the University of Melbourne. Lisa's research has focused on the medium and long-term effects of disasters on communities. With the support of the Bush Fire and Natural Hazard CRC, her team and their partners have produced a disaster recovery guide for people, organisations and governments managing emergency recovery, which aims to support wellbeing after disasters by providing evidence-based guidance to aid decision-making. The big picture, I think, is that we, when we think of disasters, we focus on physical safety, and what we need to really be thinking about is mental safety as well, and well-being, and so those community-level measures are really important. And also recognising that the longer-term impacts of these events. I think sometimes people think as soon as everything's cleaned up, we're all good but actually it takes a lot longer and for those who've lost homes, lost income, if there's been a relationship breakdown, those mental health impacts can last five, ten years down the track because it, all of these additional stresses have, have made it difficult to get back on track. The complex and often traumatic nature of community recovery is a concern for Rowena particularly as she would be relying on people and resources from outside of her own emergency management team following a larger scale event. I think one of the main challenges that we have is that um, we don't go through it very often. It's, um, uh, you know, maybe it's a once in a lifetime situation when you would go through recovery. And, and look, that's absolutely our focus. And what we know is that even though each community is very different and the, and the circumstances of each event are very different, the human impacts are actually often quite similar. And so that's where we can draw from past events to guide us to what to expect in new events. Um, but we also know that people are so under pressure that they can't, they can't look at the evidence. That's ridiculous. And so what we try and do is bring together the evidence into a resource that's just really quick, says this is what we know, this is what you might want to think about in, in the decision making at, at this time after an event. Lisa's Recovery Capitals, or RECAP guide, aims to quickly build the capacity of the recovery workforce, which may surge with workers from other sectors following disaster events. RECAP is based on seven recovery capitals. Natural, social, financial, cultural, political, built and human, and the connections between them. It aims to support well-being after disasters by providing evidence-based guidance on factors that influence the recovery process. Do you see the um, resources that have been produced out of the research as, as something that um, 
uh, would be brought into practice with the community as part of preparedness? Yes, so uh, I mentioned that the, the recap guide is the primary audience was recovery workers, but actually it's very deliberately designed so it will be just as accessible and useful for community to use as a resource or to use with community and also to have conversations with senior decision makers and to have something to back up the, the, your suggestions about what services might be needed or what funds might be needed. The evidence base that Lisa describes is an important function of the RECAP guide and one that can prove useful when justifying decisions or actions in the face of public and political pressure following incidents. There's a pressure to spend money quickly and have everything fixed and sorted and let's move on. But there really needs to be allowance for a gradual recovery and allowing people to, to recover in their own way. I mean, some people will move really quickly to rebuild the house and then they might fall in a heap after that. Whereas others just can't make a decision about anything, let alone rebuilding. Um, but when they do arrive at the point where they're ready to make those decisions, then that will be, you know, rewarding for them. So we have to have some flexibility and some care and compassion, really, in, in the way services are delivered and made available. Rowena is interested to find out more about the longer-term impacts that major events can have on communities. So she's meeting with Tim Carroll, a long-term Surf Coast residence who was running the Aries Inlet pub in the early 1980s and who experienced firsthand the impact and aftermath of the Ash Wednesday fire in 1983. The fire caused the devastation of popular coastal towns along the Great Ocean Road, such as Aries Inlet, Anglesey and Lawn, and resulted in three fatalities and 782 buildings destroyed. I, I shut the pub and then we went up to the, um, what's the top shop up here where the fire station was, waiting for the truck to come back to change crews and do things. But um, then the fire exploded around us and we all went our separate ways and um, came back the next day to, to, to just a devastated black landscape. So it was quite incredible, the, the speed of it and, the, and then the actual aftermath of what was left, which was just absolute you know, devastation. Tim recalls how the rebuilding of Aries Inlet led to many improvements and opportunities in the area, which ultimately would change the character of the town. Lisa's research describes this mix of fortunes during recovery and the variety of impacts this is likely to have upon different individuals and groups. I mean, what happened in Aries was this little town was probably one of the last places in Victoria to have water on. And then on February the 17th, everybody had a tap a vacant block and soon after a check to build a house. So it totally changed the character of the town because then people built their homes around the fact that you had water and you weren't relying on tank water. So, you know, there was two showers and there was dishwashers and there was bigger houses and people built with the idea of, oh, we might retire down here. Okay. So it just totally changed the character of the town from then on. But I think the thing that's changed there is now is just the fact that that socioeconomic you know, thing it's just shrunk down. You've got to be wealthy to be here now. Mm. You can't um, generationally, you know, your kids can't probably afford to be here. Um, so that's going to have an impact on the town in the long run. Tim's experience also sheds light on the need for communities to be ready for change and disruption ahead of major events and disasters. The ability of a community to bounce back from disaster is closely linked to its existing levels of connectedness, preparedness and resilience. One of the things I find interesting about recovery research is that it's really helpful to identify who might be at risk of poor outcomes and so where people might need extra support. It's really helpful to identify who has, has had a, a positive recovery, I guess, because we might learn from that to benefit others. But those lessons from recovery also tell us what would have been really good to have in place before the event. And so it, it also helps us with preparedness and building, I guess, what you could call a resilient community. And the nice thing about some of those aspects of, of what would make a difference 
is that they also are just really positive in everyday life. That's just gold. Like, what that tells you is you can have that in place before any event happens. If you've got a community where there's lots of local involvement, that community is likely to fare better if something happens. They're also likely to just have a really nice life living in that community. So it's not like you're, you're trying to invest money in something that in 20 years might be useful. It's like, well, let's do something that's great for now and will also protect us if something terrible happens. Back at the Surf Coast Shire Council, Rowena has had time to reflect on her meetings with Lisa and Tim. She's impressed by the accessibility of the research through the RECAP guide and its ability to provide information where and when it is most needed. For someone who may not have been involved in um, emergency management training within their organisation and are brought in, you know, they're on the fringes, they, they sort of know about it but may not have been involved. There's some principles there that are guiding you through your decision making because there's no formula really. Every, every situation is going to be entirely different. It will be a real um, a really good resource to help people come up to speed but also to give all of us confidence when we're starting to deliver a, a recovery program. Importantly for Rowena, the RECAP resource provides a research underpinning to resourcing decisions that may come under scrutiny both before and after disaster events. I keep using the word confidence um, and mandate in this um, but definitely, you know, for um, the allocation of resources within our organisation towards emergency management, but also towards that community development component. Um, so, um, you know, evidence base like this is really good to help with the decision making. And the resource itself, um, the recap resource, just to have something there that's been built by someone based on evidence that you can go to and say, well, look, this is a trusted source of, um, of good information and a good way to structure things, do things, share information um, in the recovery effort. So we all love a resource <laughs> that's just there sitting ready for us, um, that's easy to use. So that's something that's going to be really valuable, I think. Mm -hmm.